Okay, so it's uh, my pleasure to welcome to our seminar uh, Jeremy Joudiou. Uh, uh, he uh, got his PhD already some time ago from University of Brest, I, I believe. Uh, uh, his interest is in uh, mathematical relativity, so he's currently in uh, the Albert, Albert Einstein Institute in uh, Potsdam. And he's going to talk to us about uh, Hertz potentials uh, and the, the decay of higher spin fields, uh, which is more of an analysis talk, but I think it will be interest of interest to an audience of some differential geometry. So, Jeremy, please go ahead. So many thanks, uh, many thanks, Igor, for the invitation. And I, I, I'm, if there's more people who've joined recently, I'm repeating. If you have any question, please do ask any question and do interrupt me so that things are clear. So. As Igor mentioned, I'm interested in health potentials and decay of higher spin fields. And let me first give you the basic, the most basic idea uh, about these things. And uh, most of the thing I want to talk about is symmetry operators in a very, very wide meaning. The basic, the most basic symmetry operators you can think of for people doing relativity is the thing I'm about to present there. So you are considering a wave equation here on R4, which I will later call Minkowski space-time. And as a symmetry operator, I will consider the partial differential in the time direction. So I will, to the solution phi, I will associate solution dt phi. And it's relatively easy to notice that if phi is a solution to that equation, so is dt phi. Okay, let's call that a symmetry operator. And as an analyst, when you see these sort of things, you are thinking that any property, any estimate which is true for phi under a reasonable assumption should be true for dt phi. And this is something that you might want to use. For instance, in the context of a Cauchy problem, like I'm considering, again, a solution to the wave equation, with these initial data, let's say smooth with compact support doesn't really matter. And for solution of the wave equation, it is natural to define that quantity here, which I will call energy, which is the squared norm, which is the squared of the partial differential in T, plus here, these are the partial x1, x2, x3. So these are the spatial direction of phi squared. And if phi satisfies the wave equation, then this quantity is conserved here. Well, as I say, partial T is a symmetry operator. So provided that this quantity is defined initially, then it is conserved. So what have we done there? We have used this mapping, which send a solution to the wave equation to another solution of the wave equation. And I have propagated using this symmetry operator an, an identity. Sometimes it's an equality. Sometimes it's another object. Today, that will be another thing. Today, that will be point towards estimates. OK, this is what I mean by symmetry operators. In that talk, the kind of object I will we'll be talking about will be on Minkowski space-time. And the kind of operator I'm interested in will take a wave equation to solution what I will call higher spin fields. By higher spin fields, you can put Dirac equation, Maxwell's equation, or linearized gravity. This is essentially these two things I will be talking about. And the purpose of the talk would be to try knowing the asymptotic behavior of solutions wave equation. So knowing what is happening here, obtain a precise description of the asymptotic behavior of higher spin fields. So here, instead of propagating energies, I will propagate using these symmetry operators pointwise estimates. So some motivation, very, very, very vaguely, at least at that time, uh, this is what we were interested in. Um, there's a big problem in GR, which one day will be solved, but uh, not immediately, uh, which is a problem of stationary, the stability of stationary solutions of uh, vacuum Einstein's equations, in particular, prime of stability of black holes. 
stability, like you have to think stability in terms of ODE. You have a solution of an ODE, you perturbate a little bit, and you see if you go back to that solution of that ODE. Okay. There's one thing. If, if you are a person, an analyst, studying that problem, the perturbation of a black hole, of a solution to Einstein equation, which is a black hole solution, will solve a system of Cassini wave equations. So these two words, system and Cassini are important. This problem is way too complicated to uh, attack it brute force, so you will degrade it. And there's several degradations that you can do. And the most basic thing that you can do on a black hole would be to look at the scalar wave equation on a black hole. More interestingly, you can be interested in Maxwell or linear gravity on a black hole. And here, the aspect of the perturbation you're interested in is the system aspect. So what you get here is a system of hyperbolic PD, sorry, a hyperbolic system of PD. And it happens that this hyperbolic system of PD has a hierarchy encoded in it. Igor is a specialist of those things, so please do ask him question about that. I will not answer this question. But the question is, can this hierarchy be exploited to say something about the asymptotic behavior of that system? And in particular, in that hierarchy, what will be happening is that there will be one specific equation, scalar equation, which in that system you can use to control the rest of the equation in that system. And this was the motivation of that work that I'm talking about now. OK, we want to ask the same question for higher spin fields on Minkowski space time. So again, I'm talking about higher spin field, but think Maxwell's equation or linear gravity. And in that case, the answer is yes. And the symmetry operators that we will be looking at um, would be actually construction of certain type of potentials which are satisfying wave equation for these higher spin fields. And these potentials, they have a name, they are called Hertz potentials. They were they have been introduced more than a century ago. And so it's it's a very old idea, and this old idea was widely used in the 70s, widely, somehow used in the 70s to address the kind of problem I mentioned before. But as I say, I am an analyst and I want to, uh, I mean, I'm an analyst and I want to get estimates. And so I will need to recast this problem of potential in the context of a Cauchy problem. And what specifically I will be interested in is the relation between initial data for the potential, satisfying a wave equation, and the initial data for the highest spin fields. And it happens that this relation is interested in what you are interested to these elliptic complexes. And I think this is why I'm here today. And you can use this relation to deduce completely the asymptotic behavior of higher spin field from scalar wave equation. And in particular, you will you recover some hierarchy of decay. So I will not be talking about that too much, but it happens that, again, these higher spin fields, this is a hyperbolic system of PD and not all the solution of that system decays at a, in a similar fashion. And here, I think this is probably the first time that, that we were providing a precise um, answer on how this decay was arising. OK. I think that's it for the introduction. Are things clear? Is the purpose clear so far? Do do you have any question? No one has any questions, so that's great. Let me carry on. So I'm calling that reminder. Uh, maybe it's not that much of a reminder, but before going further, I need to be talking about that. I need to be talking about the decay of wave equation, so solution of the wave equation. So here I'm interested in wave equation on Minkowski space time. So this is the equation I'm interested in. And I am insisting heavily, I am looking at dimension three. What I'm saying is not true in uh, dimension one plus one, and it's not true in dimension two plus one. I mean, or in most, more specifically, it's not true in, in even spatial dimension. 
uh, and it's not true in dimension one plus one. So it's true only from dimension three. There's two things which you will need to be knowing for solution of the wave equation to consider the asymptotic behavior. The first thing is that the value of phi at a point Q will depend only of the value of phi on the path light cone from Q. This is a Regan's principle. This is the first important thing that you need. And the second ingredient that you might want to consider, and it's more or less tautological with what I'm saying here, is that the fundamental solutions, they are more or less Dirac delta distribution supported on cones. And with these two ingredients, you can hand wavily basically understand what you expect for solution of the wave equation. So let's make a drawing. So the axis first. Here, I will have the, I am working in, in, in spherical coordinates. So here I'm having the standard radius R, which is uh, x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared. Or, and here I'm having the time. I'm looking at a point in space time Q and I'm drawing in that diagram the past light code from Q. I, and the... moment, I asked you a question. So sure. you consider a wave equation in the space of the uh, which the space you consider. So that's um, a Minkowski space, uh, that means that's a, 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 a far? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. This is this is here, as I said, Minkowski yeah, space yeah, time yeah, yes. R4 and so, I mean, uh, I'm not writing any metric. Maybe I should write a metric, but... Uh, uh, that's is... clear because I, I was uh, a miss. Yes, okay, thank you. So that you work on the time on the Minkowski space R4, right? Yes, 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 okay. yes. It's Minkowski space R4. Yeah. Okay, I'm starting again. So here again, we have our spherical coordinate and here we have a time, the, uh, time coordinate here. I'm having a point in space time and the light pass light cone from that point looks like that here and here. And as I say, it will intersect the set of initial data here. Here, if I'm looking at the point P, the future light cone will look like that here. So tangent to pass light cones, you have the, you can consider the generators of these pass light cones. And the generator of the past light cone will be generated by that vector field. And the generator of the future light cone will be generated by that vector field. Okay. So this vector field is in green because later on it will be referred to as good directions and this will be referred to as bad directions. Also, I will consider a derivative on the sphere of radius R. Uh, which are here transverse to, to, the, to the screen. Okay, so now I want to talk about asymptotic behavior and all what's on this picture is sufficient to understand what's happening. So let's have a look at the point Q. If I want to calculate Q, as I said, I need to understand the intersection of that past light cone with initial data. If the point Q start moving in that direction, then this point here, will move in that direction, right? So here I'm moving forward in time. And this point here will move, will move forward in the R direction. In other words, you should expect that the behavior of the initial data as R goes to plus infinity should be correlated to the behavior as T goes to plus infinity. Actually, in dimension three, this is the same behavior. It's a calculation that you need to be doing. But this is the first information of the asymptotic behavior you need to consider. Now, let's say the point Q here will move in the direction dt plus dr. Then what is happening? This point here will stay at the place where it is, while this point will be moving in that direction. Here, you, want, you should expect that because this point stays here, something will happen. And it will not be the same asymptotic behavior that you will have if you move in the time direction only here. And so these are these two aspects that we will be looking at. So here, 
later on it will be referred to as uh, exterior region this direction and here it will be the interior okay when i'm talking about moving in that direction and moving in that direction okay so this is the first thing i wanted to say the second thing i wanted to say and that I told you is that you have to think that solution of the fundamental solution are supported on cones. So there's two from, well, I mean, it's not something which is very precise, but let's take that as an idea. But let's say I'm looking here at, at a point P and a future cone here. When you differentiate here, the, from the, 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 the Dirac delta distribution supported on a cone, in that direction, you don't see anything happening, right? Because this is a Dirac delta distribution, so nothing is happening. So more or less, you are killing the fundamental solution by differentiating in that direction. Same way, if you are differentiating in a direction which is transverse to that cone, which is spherical direction, you will also kill it. While, while you are differentiating in that direction, you will see a jump. Right, you are going through a Dirac delta distribution, so you will see you will you will produce a derivative of that Dirac delta distribution. So the derivative of solution of the wave equation, whether you differentiate in a good direction, so the green one, or in a bad direction, will not be the same. And these are these three points that I need to be addressing later on if I want to talk about solution of the wave equation. A decay of solution of the wave equation. Was this picture clear? Okay. Yeah, I think it was very clear. Thank you. Okay, so I need to talk a little bit about an analytic setting because this is important for, for what I want to talk a little bit later on. So the natural problem, natural so the natural analytic setting for this is a Cauchy problem. So I will look at initial data, which are in some Sobolev spaces, H1 and with derivative in L2, right? Let, let's, let's not be very precise. And if you take solution whose initial data are like that, then automatically, you know, your solution will be continuous with value in H1 and also C1 with value in L2. Okay, whatever that means. Just to say that this is the natural setting for the Cauchy problem. Here, I'm interested in asymptotic behavior and sober spaces. So standard sober spaces don't encompass this natural behavior. So you need to go a little bit further than that. And what we introduce is actually weighted subordinate spaces, right? And these subordinate spaces are, are the, have a parameter sigma. So K is the number of derivatives that you take in L2. Sigma will be some weight which describes the decay. And the only thing that you need to remember is the following, that if you control two derivatives in L2 and with that weight sigma, then Pointwise, your solution will decay as x to the sigma. Sorry, your initial data, it's an initial data here. The initial data will decay like x to the sigma. If you take three derivatives, then not only psi will decay like x to the sigma, but the derivative of psi will decay like x to the sigma minus one. So a li little bit, a little bit, a little bit more decay. So here, to think about that, think what's happening for polynomials or rational fractions, right? The more you so the more you differentiate a polynomial, the less growth you get. The more you differentiate a rational fraction, the more decay you get, provided that the powers are the right between the denominator and the numerator. But so the more I'm differentiating, the more decay I get. This is really the thing that you have to keep in mind when you are differentiating initial data. Okay. So now let's let's write the initial the decay a little bit. So again, I'm looking at my um, my favorite Minkowski space time, and I'm looking at Cauchy problems. So I'm giving myself the value of phi at zero in that Sobolev space, and the value of dt phi in the corresponding Sobolev spaces. So here, if I'm controlling k derivative in L2 for the derivative in time, and I'm I'm controlling only k minus one, and as I say. I'm taking one derivative here. So here, if I'm dec dec decaying like x to the sigma here, I'm decaying a little bit more, sigma to the minus one. And how does this field decay? Okay, it's not very important, but 
let me give you um yeah okay let, 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 let's forget about that we don't care um here as as um as i've mentioned before there's two directions that we have to be looking at there's a long time direction and time direction if you mean this is derivative here this is the interior decay so it's when i'm looking the decay in that direction and here it will be the exterior direction and more specifically in terms of region of space time i'm looking at that would be t bigger than 3r and r between comprised between 3t and t over 3 these three is completely arbitrary right i mean just 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 to fix the ideas and if you want to get the decay for these things well how do you do it for an arbitrary sigma you take initial data you use here uh so well embeddings so if you control sufficient number of derivative in l2 you will get pointwise control and so this is what i'm writing here and you will get an integral representation of the solution right i mean this is very basic things and at the end of the day the only thing that you need to understand so you will plug this here decay in there and then well you just have to calculate what's happening here so it happens that this is something that you can calculate explicitly and um, i'm jumping over the calculations let's just have a look quickly at the result so here uh, let's forget about that and u it's one plus t minus r and v is one plus t plus r so here is my phi and it will decay the more I'm differentiating, so I can take k equal m equal zero. When I'm taking k equal m equal zero, I'm noticing that I'm having u to the one plus sigma v to the minus one. U equal constant means that I am differentiating in the exterior direction, like in the dt plus dr. So you notice that I'm having only v decay in that direction, right? Now, when I'm differentiating, when I'm looking at the solution in the time direction, then the decay for u and v adds up. So, in other words, if I'm starting with initial data which decays like sigma, then the solution phi will decay like sigma, as expected. This is what I told you before. The decay that you have for the initial data in the r direction, you find in the t direction. But when you look in the outgoing direction, this thing here is morally constant, and you get only to the v to the minus one. Okay. Second aspect I told you about here, I'm having my favorite good derivative. Oops, I'm sorry, I wanted I wanted to use green. Um, here I'm having my good derivative. And the more I'm differentiating in the direction of the good derivative, the more decay I get in V. And if I'm differentiating in the bad derivative, I am getting decay in U. In other words, the more if I'm differentiating in the good derivative, I am improving the decay everywhere. But if I'm differentiating in direction of a bad derivative, I am getting decay, better decay only in the time direction. Okay, here to do that calculation, you need to have sufficient amount of decay before and before starting. Uh, this is numerology, so I don't want to talk about that. Um, okay. Here, I think this is more or less the sharpest type of result that you can get in terms of pointwise decay for solution of the wave equation. And I wanted to insist on really the different aspect of going in the null direction or going in the time direction in the different derivative because this is crucial for the potentials afterwards. Do you have questions regarding that? No questions? 
So that's great. So you can forget everything about the analysis now and we'll go into, into, into complexes from now on. So the first thing I will do is talk about Maxwell's equation because I think this is the clearest uh, way of doing things. So now I'm looking at Maxwell equation. So I'm taking a, a screw symmetric two form. Again, I am on Minkowski space time here. And I will look at this initial data slice. So I'm looking at t equals zero. And on t equals zero, I'm having a future unit normal. T, uh, this quantity which I'm looking at. So the Faraday tensor F satisfies the Maxwell equation. So this, this two symmetric, two, uh, anti symmetric two form, if it's closed and co-closed, and here you notice the bar here is because we are on three plus one. Okay, so we are on Minkowski space time. And later on, there will be no bar. It means something, something else. Okay, so it satisfies the Maxwell equation if f is closed and co-closed. For Maxwell's equation, it is natural to define electric and magnetic fields. And to do that, you contract or you evaluate uh, your uh, screw symmetric two form in the time vector here. And because of the anti-symmetry, E and B, they look like uh, an element, they look at, like form on R4, but they actually form on R3, right? So they are defined and tangent to R each of the time slice at all times. And this quantity, a consequence of the Maxwell's equation is that this quantity are both divergence free, which is written here. And here, note that there's no bar because these are the divergence on R3, right? We are on R3 here, okay? But in particular, it means that at t equals zero, the initial data, which will consist of electric field and magnetic field need to be divergence free. So they cannot be chosen freely. They need to be divergence free to start to be good initial data for the field. Okay. So this is what I just said. And a set of initial data will consist of electric and magnetic fields at t equals zero, which are divergence free. And how do you generate solutions of Maxwell equation? Well, the most basic things you can think of is take a one form, which satisfies that equation here. So it's, it's only half of a wave equation, so to speak, then F, which is given by the differential of the potential one form satisfies Maxwell equation, right? This is more or less straightforward to check. Okay, this A here is just the standard Put vector potential. There's another way to generate Maxwell equation using what are called F potentials. So if you take G here, a symmetric two form, uh, and excuse, uh, I mean a two form which satisfies a wave equation, and that wave equation will be delta D plus D delta, again on R4 equals zero. Then it is obvious that F, this anti-symmetric two form here, given either by these two quantity, will satisfy the Maxwell's equation, right? If you calculate d, d bar of that, it's zero because of that identity. And if you calculate delta bar of that, it will be zero because of that identity. In other words, here, from a solution of the wave equation, you will be able to generate a solution to Maxwell's equation. And this g here is called a health potential, and, and this is, this potential uh, we are interested in today. Is this way of generating solution to Maxwell's equation clear? Yes. Okay. So now, as you have seen, um, to understand the asymptotic behavior of, of, of the wave equation, we need to understand, we need to put precise assumption on the initial data. So, What we are really interested in would be to go from a Cauchy problem for Maxwell's equation here to a Cauchy problem for health potential. And in particular, if you will, again, because this is the right setting, we are looking at 
initial data that were in this weighted sobolo space before. Here, we are, will be looking at data which are in corresponding sobolo spaces. So if you think that G is an order two potential for F, right? Because F is obtained by two derivatives of G, you will necessarily gain in regularity, right? So here, if you control only K derivative in L2, here you will control K plus two derivative in L2 as natural initial data. In terms of decay, here, if you decay like X to the sigma, when you integrate twice, you will gain in decay here and you will decay like sigma plus two and here sigma plus one, okay? And you know that by uniqueness of solutions to the Cauchy problem within the right setting, and we are in the right setting here, you know that it is sufficient to, est to establish a, uh, a relation between initial data for the Maxwell field and initial data for the health potential, right? And it happens that the relation between the initial data will be given by this standard, so I'm calling it variation of the Durham complex, right? To take the standard Durham complex, but the thing we are actually interested in will be this complex here. So you take smooth function, you differentiate it, you get one form. You take, so the co-differential star, you get again one form and delta. Again, I'm taking the divergence here. Okay, let's have a look at that. So Jeremy, uh, yes? just before you go on, uh, the relation between the decay of, of uh, F and, and G, uh, you go, you get F by differentiating G. So when you differentiate your, uh, the amount of decay should go, should increase. Is that? No, 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 no. When you differentiate a polynomial, when you differentiate a polynomial, the decay decrease. You have, Sorry, X, uh, you have X2, you differentiate, it, you differentiate it twice and, 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 and you get something yes. which is constant. So it decays. So, sorry, just remind me, this sigma, yes. it means that decay at infinity goes as X to the sigma. To, to the, ah, not minus. No, no, no. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. So X to the sigma. Did so I... sigma for you, so decay would be when sigma is negative. Yes, but you can take sigma positive if you want. That doesn't really matter. I mean, you know, we want things to be stable, so it needs to decay, right? This, this is a purpose in our life. I mean, in, in our life, sorry, in my life. <laughs> yes. Okay, so, so now what I need to be working on is trying to get the relation between this electric and magnetic field and this G and DTG, initial data for our potential. And so the thing that I will do is that I will assume that I'm having this relation satisfied and I will calculate, uh, and I'm noticing something, yes, okay. And I will calculate the relation between uh, the initial data for the field. So the initial data for the field here, G, it's a two form, right? And so it has also an electric and magnetic field for that two form, right? By, by taking G of T uh, and, and star G of, so that would be H, star G of T, that would be K, right? And so, here, if you restrict this relation at t equals zero and project the right thing in the right direction, you will get the following relation between the electric and magnetic field of your Faraday tensor with the electric and magnetic field of your two form here potential, your health potential. And this is this relation. And as you notice, E and B are both in the image of delta, right? by construction. Okay, now I want to solve it. And, 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 and the only, so to solve it, just for simplification, I will assume, so here is a solution to the wave equation. So I can fix either the value of H and DTH and K and DTK. And for simplification, and because it doesn't change anything in, in the problem I'm interested in, I'm assuming that H equal K equals zero. And at the end of the day, I'm getting rid of that. And I just want to solve these two equations here. It's just simplification of the problem. And what do I do? Well, 
I am a modest analyst, and the only thing I know to do is solve a Laplacian. So I'm solving a Laplacian. And so instead of, of solving this equation, I will solve my Laplacian. And, and I know that I can construct pre-image by the Laplacian of E and B, which belongs to that space. And this is a pre-image of E and B, H tilde, K tilde, OK? And so. Explain me the, the, the previous page. Yes. So that uh, you change the uh, uh, I to uh, what is the I tilde, and then you change the the. I mean that uh, instead of solving the pre, uh, initial equation, you try to make the new nice uh, equation by. I uh, how to say not solving for k and h, but for I tilde and k. Ah, so that you don't try what is the I tilde and k tilde here. Uh, uh, um, so what, what is, is H-tilde and K-tilde exactly? Yeah, I'm just taking the pre-image of E and B by the Laplacian, and that's it. Right? I mean, this is, this is what H-tilde and K-tilde are. Uh, but uh, still under the assumption that uh, uh, E and B are living uh, in that space. Yes, yes. Yeah, are, are given by this formula yeah, yeah, where yeah. just the, the time derivatives are not, not vanishing. Right? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the time derivative part of the initial data is not zero. So just as a simple here, equation. so yeah. for the Maxwell equation, there's no time derivative of the initial data, right? Here, I'm looking at the initial data for G, and I'm assuming not not the derivative, but I'm killing off that term here. Mm -hmm. I'm keeping mm -hmm. the time derivative of G only. So in general, you could have both G and yeah. Uh, yeah. time derivative of G non-zero, but you're taking a simple yeah, yeah. case. Yeah, yeah. Just for illustration, okay. Okay. Okay, yes. So, and it happens that, we, which is which is nice for us, that the fact that, that, that you, the geometry constraints are satisfied will tell us are compatible, precisely compatible with the fact that I'm able to solve my equations for the potential, right? If the geometric constraint were not satisfied, then I wouldn't be able to find the pre-image by the potential. Okay, so now I can take these initial data for the potential, right? So here, these are the initial data for the electric field of the head's potential and for the magnetic field of the head's potential. But there's a condition, right? I mean, as I said before, I am working using the image of the Laplacian, and this this I need this image to be to be to be to be to be. I need I need good properties for the Laplacian to, to be able to invert it. So there's a problem of kernel, co-kernel, and so on and so forth. You know the story. And so a priori, you will need to be able to you need you will need to exclude a certain number of solutions. To do that, and you will need to exclude this kernel. I mean, so you need to, but I'm telling you that I'm not talking about that, but it happens that the solution which you need to be excluding there, this is a finite dimensional space. But uh, if you brute force calculation, calculate these things, and you can nonetheless put them in that form. This is just a calculation. It's annoying to do, but it's not a problem. So at the end of the day, this is not an obstruction to have a representation to by half potential. Just saying. Okay, so the lemma just says that. So here there's DK assumption, but these DK assumptions are, are, are irrelevant for the purpose. But essentially, what have we done? If we have solution EB which live in that space, so these are K derivative in L2 that decays like sigma in one forms which satisfies the constraints, and I will be able to constrain, as this is what I said, I will be able to, con to construct new E1 and B1 so that for this E and EB and this B, I can add an image, something in the image of delta, which are orthogonal to this kernel. Because of that, you will be able to avoid the problem of the Laplacian not being uh, subjective in the circumstances we're interested in. And this is just like a projection rescaling argument. There's really not, nothing there. This is really done to us calculation. 
So this E1 and B1 are, you know, would belong to some finite dimensional space. Yes, they will belong to finite dimensional space, and they will belong to the to the to the image of delta. So they are okay. they are good. Okay. So in other words, what have we done so far? Here, we have proven the existence potential for Maxwell fields. How have we done that? First, there's a restriction on the decay because, as you know, for to invert the Laplacian, there's a certain number of, of decay behaviors that need to be excluded. These are the so-called except the so-called exceptional set, and this exceptional set will be z minus in that circumstances. And I need to get enough regularity to do that. But this is really a fake problem here. So I'm looking at solution of the Maxwell's constraints equation that belongs to that space. And I will be able to construct two two forms, J0 and J1, which belongs to the corresponding space. Using elliptic regularity, I will be able to control the norm of these two forms by the norm of the initial data of the Faraday tensor. And on the top of that, by uniqueness of solutions to Cauchy problem, F will be represented by half potential. And this health potential satisfies the wave equation and it admits initial data G0 and G1, which I control by elliptic regularity. Okay, so now I'm here. I'm having, I can represent reasonable solution to Maxwell's equation. I can control the initial data for the health potential by the initial data for the Maxwell potential. And from that equation here, and what I know from the scalar wave equation, I can calculate explicitly the decay of f, right? Because I know exactly of all solutions of the scalar wave equation decays, but as well all the derivatives, right? So I will need to decompose that thing into spherical derivative, outgoing direction, and ingoing direction. So the dt plus dr, dt d minus dr, and calculate the corresponding things for f. I'm not doing that calculation. I don't think that's particularly relevant for, for you, but uh, is the procedure clear for Maxwell's equation? Yes? So just to, uh, to make sure, uh, because G solves uh, the wave equation, yeah. uh, you know it's uh, space-time decay properties and in time and, yeah. and uh, null directions. Yeah. And because of the representation, of the Hertz potential, you can deduce the decays yes. uh, for, for F. Yes. Uh, but uh, uh, so G is not a scalar by itself. It's it's a two no, but Absolutely not. Yes. In space, you can basically think of every component. Yes. Scalar, right. That's that's how you can apply this. The yes, way. of course. But if you were on on type D space time, you know that you will have to use some specific family of of spinners, which are right to do that calculate sort of calculation but anyway uh here we are minkowski space time so we can do that mm -hmm. and and this is uh, yes. check moment in your proposition you don't relate it e not be not is a uh, equation here so that can you uh that means that's how to say you or the the, the idea that means that uh, if you have the initial data it not may not satisfy certain conditions that mean in measure of the laplacian then you can solve the uh, um, uh, 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 potential problem yeah right 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 the only condition the only condition i'm having is any constraints for the initial data for maxwell's equations that is the delta here equal here only this uh, this constraint yes and then how it go to the uh, g and the g not i mean that's in the proposition i don't see the relation between uh, uh, the g and the e no. a, e, uh, e and b you you can you okay, here. Uh, the relation is here so it's not explicit i'm sorry it's not as explicit that you'd wish it to be yes but h and k are the electric and magnetic field. Yes. Okay, so these are given by this formula and you get here the relation. Okay, okay, yes. So, I mean, the, the notation slightly is different from what you use in proposition, but these, these K and H are related to the G1, right? Yes. Yes, this, this, this K and H are related to the G1. Yes. Is related to G1. Yes, yes. Yeah. 
But I, I, I mean, the, I could write the explicit formula for these things, but honestly, this is not very beautiful. Uh, and and but I could do it if you want, really. No, I, I think it's it's okay. I think it's clear. Okay. So I've done that for Maxwell. Now I will do it for linear gravity, just to be clear, right? It works for any field of arbitrary spin. So I'm just doing them because I can write them in tensor indices. I mean, more or less. Okay, so now I will do linear gravity. So linear gravity, uh, first I need to formulate the problem. So I will look at a four tensor, W, A, B, C, D. So think of a vile, vile curvature here. And it satisfies exactly the same, sorry, I said curvature. And it satisfies exactly the same symmetry as the Val curvature or the Riemann tensor of whatever, right? The same thing. So it's anti-symmetric in A, B, C, D, and then you can switch A, B, C, D, and then you have your, 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 your symmetry between B, C, D. And, and the pro linear gravity on Minkowski space-time is written like that. This quantity is divergent free. You will take initial data. And these initial data lack in the Maxwell case, you can define the equivalent of an electric and magnetic field by, contracted, by contracting your thing twice. And the contraction has to be wrong, right? Because it's anti-symmetric. And you, you can define an electric and magnetic field with by contracting your W, your uh, sorry, your 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 um, vile curvature twice with a time direction, and you can define the notion of Hodge dual exactly in a similar way uh, for this for this curvature, and you will get your magnetic part of your curvature, and this electric and magnetic part, like in the Maxwell case, they are divergence free. As a PDE system, this is a hyperbolic system of order one with 10 unknowns. And so you can define a concept of F potential for that. Unfortunately, if you want to write it in tenses, the formula is really, really, really ugly. And like by really, really, really ugly, like I mean really, really, really ugly. So I'm not writing it, but I'm looking for health potential, which is a derivative of order four of uh, of xi here, so in terms of spinners, your so your Hertz potential would be so satisfying the divergence condition, right? That's that's what wave talking. equation. Uh, Hertz potential needs to satisfy wave equation. Y yes, uh, yes, but I mean the the form of the operator, the way you produce W from xi. Uh, has to be such that uh, the divergence of W is, is zero. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So um, if if W was not uh, traceless, so if it, it had the, the algebraic properties of real yes. tensor, then the uh, so if you if you cast this question in terms of complexes, the the complex you would need to use is. I think the, the Calabi yes. complex, which uh, starts with the queuing, then has linear agreement and so on. So the 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 formula for for the W would then factor through the linear agreement. I would assume so. Yes. Uh, but here it's it's more complicated. Well, wait a second. I'm about to talk about that, right? Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> okay. So for those of you who know we know Penrose notation. Uh, everything can be written in much easier way in, in terms of Penrose notation. So I'm taking a totally symmetric spinner, which is divergence free. So this is a Dirac equation of for, 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 for spinner of valence two. And I'm taking data and the constraints are just that the in terms of space time on, in terms of space spinners that the initial data are divergence free. So now it's becoming a hyperbolic system of order one with five complex unknown and the relation with the potential is crystal clear now. Okay, but if you don't know Penrose notation, let's forget about that. Okay, so the sketch of the proof, this is exactly the same proof as before. 
except that now instead of using the Laplacian, I will use the square of the Laplacian. And the important thing is again, the integrability condition on EAB and BIB, which are satisfied. And this the integrability condition, like being the ability to produce initial data for the health potential are precisely given by the data, by the constraint satisfied by the initial data for the linear gravity problem. So here, if you take again your, your EAB, I'm talking only, only about the electric part, which is divergent three, which I will denote delta two equals zero, then you will be able to construct a symmetric tensor GAB such that E can be written, can be obtained by calculating the, co the linearized cotton York tensor evaluated at GAB. So this is where the elliptic complexes for curvatures are popping in. So where is it coming from geometrically, this thing? This is an old problem which was studied in the 80s and it's related to the problem of conformal rigidity. So if you take a metric G0 and you will look at a family GT of metric, which are, they say they are conformally rigid if there's a family of diffeomorphism, so that when you look at the action of this diffeomorphism on your metric, then you will get this family metric GT and a conformal factor. And if you look at the infinitesimal version of that equation at t equals zero, then you will observe that you have these conditions here that needs to be satisfied. You will end up solving the conformal killing equation with a source term. And this source term here, this equation can only be integrated in G0 if the source term satisfies these constraints. And these constraints, again, are the linear scotto York tensor. So the, yes, I, I wrote explicitly the formula here, but it's, it's quite ugly. So I remember, I mean, I guess the cotton York tensor, this is, a, this is you, you know that in, 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 in Riemannian geometry, in dimension bigger than four, the criteria for conformal flatness is y equals zero, and the cotton York tensor plays that role in dimension three, right? So you are conformally flat if your cotton York tensor is zero, and you are looking at the linear cotton York tensor, and this is that tensor here. And these uh, integrability properties, they were described in the 80s by Gatsky Goldschmidt in a book written in French. And it was rediscovered later by a colleague, Bobby Baig, uh, in 97, who was precisely interested in this related question to construct specific initial data for Einstein's equations. What is the title of that, that book in French? Uh, I don't remember, but I can find it for you later on if you want. Uh, Ta -ta -ta -ta. Deformation infinitesimal des structures conformes plates. I can, Merci. I can, de rien. Yes. Okay. And so here, so to make a parallel, so we're, in the Maxwell case, we are solving that equation, right? So this was our electric potential and, and, and this was the initial data for our potential. And now we are solving that equation in the spinto case, where now these are the initial data for our, uh, for our um, linear as gravity, and this is the initial data for our potential. And the constraints, they are described by these two complexes. So here, this is this quote unquote variation of the Durham complex. And the second line, we have here one forms. Here we have our, um, our um, conformal killing equation or conformal, here, the space are symmetric tensors, traceless symmetric two tensors. Here, we have the linear scotton York, and here we have the two divergence. Yes, conformal killing operator, it's written here. Okay, and using this structure, you will have in an exactly similar fashion uh, a representation of solution of linear gravity that has potential. Um, so, in other words, here again, we have. This is a condition on our decay. Again, we have to invert uh, square for Laplacian, so we have to exclude a certain number of weights. 
a certain number of decay behavior, which are again the acceleration weight. Again, I need some regularity to do that, whatever. But if I'm looking at a solution of my Cauchy problem for linear gravity, I will be able to construct initial data for my health potential, which have some regularity. I will be to control this data by the initial data for my linear gravity for my linear gravity. I will have a representation of my solution to linear gravity by a health potential, which satisfies the wave equation with the right initial data. This is exactly the same theorem as for Maxwell. So as I mentioned before, the same, um, the same, uh, the same thing is true for um, for all, all higher spin field, right? Whatever, whatever the integer is, or the half integer is, like it's all for one spin, one half, and all spin, right? Okay, it's twenty seven already. So yes. Just, so, just saying to conclude uh, the talk yeah. now. Uh, but uh, yeah. just a question about this, the, the proposition. Yeah. Uh, so I just want to understand the uh, a bit of the numerology. So um, the the shift in the um, the Sobolev and decay indices compare uh, between xi and psi. Yes. Uh, so I see that the the sigma is shifted by four, yes. which is related to the fourth order yes. of. The, the this uh, by Laplacian yes you, you, you invert um, and uh, the 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 shift in the in Sobolev index by two is uh, because uh, so why why is it by two and not by four where do you see it by two uh, so C zero has Sobolev index S zero plus two no but it's it should be because it's a typo Ah, okay. So, okay, okay. I mean, I mean, I'm inverting a square Laplacian. So, so, so regular yes. regularity will be will be will be will be elliptic regularity will be applied to the Laplacian square. Okay, okay. Now, now I understand. Thanks. Okay, so. Uh, okay, so I don't think you want to see estimates. Uh, just to conclude on that talk. Um, this thing was a one shot, right? I mean, the particularity of uh, is that we can solve everything using uh, using the Laplacian on Minkowski space time. As soon as you start going on curved space time, and in particular black hole space time, you are facing a certain number of problems that you need to be dealing with. So you have a certain number of algebraic issues, which are, first you have charges, which you need to be able to exclude. Charges means static solutions to uh, your equations, and you need to be able to exclude them a priori to be able to do anything. Second, you will go from solution to linear as graph to solution to, to a to wave equation, which is now a system of equation and 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 this system this you have you you will get again a hierarchy of equation for that system because you're on a curved background you won't get uh, so you will have to deal with that hierarchy of wave equation instead of that. so is it useful then you have another problem which is the analy the analysis you would need to be developing the proper tools to do the analysis I mentioned here and for some reason no one's uh, it's never been done properly. It's been done to some extent for, for, for Maxwell field, but what are these tools I'm talking about? You need to be essentially able to solve a, a boundary problem with arbitrary decay, right? So you will be essentially on R3 minus a bow, and, and you would have a boundary problem, uh, and you will have to, to check to do the entire construction uh, in that context. And it's not particularly uh, interesting work to do, let's be honest about that. And, and I don't think the colleagues doing general relativity would find that interesting. There has been extensions to that work, to care space time, based on more subtle uh, hierarchy of equations. But 
Igor must have talked about that several times. Igor or one of his collaborators, I'm assuming during your seminar. So I let Igor answer any question about that. Um, let me say something else about that. In 2017, there was uh, people, they were, I mean, one thing which is interesting here is that as you notice, solution of Maxwell's equation in US gravity can be chosen freely. It's true as well for Einstein's equation. Solution initial data for Einstein's equation can be chosen freely. You need to construct them. And this description here provide a linearized version of the construction of initial data for Einstein's equations. And um, it has been speculated that this construction, linearized construction, could be used in the nonlinear problem of constructing initial data for, for Einstein's equation as well. And, and uh, under pressure, I committed a note about that uh, where I'm explaining how you can construct initial data uh, for this potential based on the representation by potential. Uh, and this, I know this has been investigated, but not by me because I've been working on different things right now. Um, let me be clear, I still think that there's things to be done on curved space time and part of the black hole space time, but the amount of pre-work to be done and in terms of analysis to be done is still quite large. And uh, whether it will be useful or not is still a question. Okay, I will stop here and I will thank you for your patience. Many thanks. So let's, uh, thanks Jeremy. Uh, of course, uh, now we have time for questions. So please, anybody? So uh, let me I ask the question. So you say that the uh, IC is uh, if you have some special constraint for the uh, E and B, that mean related to Laplace, and therefore you have some complex. But that I do not see that uh, really you need uh, the complex, or uh, you that is a kind of the uh, how to say um, check a nice thing associated to C because uh, you have the, from analysis you I don't see that why you use a uh, Assistant of complex here. So, uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. So, what am I saying here? Um, the initial data will be in the kernel of that. Yes. R right. And 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 I'm interested in constructing initial data for my mm -hmm. health potential, which live here. Right. Yes. So the ability to 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 produce data in, in, in is precisely described by that part of the complex here. If I were not in the kernel of that thing, I won't be able to construct that thing. I, I see, I see. So I see, yes. So maybe I can make a, a, a technical remark uh, that, that will make sense to, to geometrists uh, or, or people who, who know a bit more about complexes. So this uh, Laplacian uh, or uh, by Laplacian that uh, Jeremy used, I mean, it is related to the complex. Uh, so it is, uh, yeah. uh, it plays the same role as the Laplacian in, in the Hodge theory for the drum complex. It's built from the complex using homotopy operators. So it's, okay. a, it's a kind of contracting homotopy. So it's not exactly contracting because Laplacians have a kernel, uh, but it's, uh, it's built from pieces of the complex uh, and the operators that go in opposite direction. Uh, which which are homotopy operators, which is called. I mean, for an analyst, these things uh, these things would pop in in terms of uh, Helmholtz-Hodge decomposition, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and this this is this is this is uh, this is how I, I I ended up on these complexes. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe maybe uh, we like to thank Jeremy for uh, his talk, uh, very, which was very very clear, and he made a lot of effort to be understandable. Uh, may I ask you some uh, some just uh, at the very beginning of your talk? Yes. You talk about uh, rotating black hole. Yes. Yeah. 
to the equation on a black hole, and you yeah. said that the, the, this is this is an ODE, and that there is no, no, no. ODE. I, I said, said uh, I, I, yes, please. Can, can you just clarify? <laughs> no, no, okay, no, 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 no. I, okay, I, I talked about stability. Okay, so just. Let, let let me go back to to what I said. I I, I made a I, I I made a shortcut. Uh, I have a talk about that if you want. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maybe but okay. So here, black holes stationary solutions. Yes. Of yes, Einstein's yes. equation. So I'm perturbing these stationary solutions, right? And what I get for the perturbation is a system of Cassin wave equation. And what I said is that these stability problems should be really thought of as when you have an ODE, like for think of an autonomous system and you have, you have one, one stationary solution of that autonomous system, then you perturb it a little bit and, 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 and look at what's happening. I think this is a sort of, of question that you, you must have seen sort of like, let, 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 let's, let me be specific. Look at that equation, right? You will have stationary solution to that equation. Yeah. And, okay. and, 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 and you know that you will have your side, oops, oops. You will have your, 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 your sinus, which, which, which does that, pop, pop, pop. And, and you have stationary solution here, stationary solution here, and you perturbate a little bit, right? And, and that's it. Right, and the perturbation is given by an ODE. Okay. This is all I'm saying. This is okay. really the PDE equivalent to that stupid problem. I see, I see. Okay, I see, I see. It, it was a huge shortcut, right? But I, I think you are more familiar with that than the stability problem of black holes. Okay. okay. So just for, 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 for the folklore, I have to mention that stability of Minkowski space-time was done in, in 90s. This is a 500 pages book. Uh, which was reduced later to 100 pages paper uh, 15 years later. The stability of stationary solution, which are Schwarzschild solutions, they are still not rotating, has been announced recently. The paper is 500 pages. I see. Right? <laughs> so, 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 like it's been announced like a couple of months ago. You can find it on the archive easily. Like, so. It's not that baby problem of all these I'm talking about here, yeah, definitely not. Yes, yes, yes. I uh, can understand that it is a very interesting point. Uh, very, very. Okay, thank you very much. So, Jeremy, I, I wanted to ask a question as well. Yes. Uh, uh, just a, uh, about the last few things that you mentioned. Uh, so, you, you said that uh, there are some ideas about. Um, uh, translating this method of constructing initial yeah. data by solving for the linear yeah. problem by by um, uh, constructing potentials yes uh, to to the nonlinear context yeah uh, what what I mean if if you know uh, what what is the the major obstacle to to that idea I I, I don't think I have I can say that okay, okay. it you, you can ask Piotr and maybe we'll answer maybe we we'll not okay. answer it's up to him okay. Okay. Uh, but, but, so Piotr has thought about it. That's. Uh, I, I haven't said that. Oh, I, all right. <laughs> so somebody has thought about it. Very good. Somebody has thought about that. Uh, okay. Uh, so if uh, there are no more questions, uh, let's uh, thank uh, Jeremy again. Yeah. Thank you. Many thanks. <laughs>